Hey there once again YouTube, how are you guys doing today? Before I start I want to let you guys know that there have been a lot of viewers recently asking me that they're confused about spectrograms because of certain YouTubers out there or even other people are possibly misinterpreting the data. And so they came to me and they're wondering, okay, what's the truth from the fiction? So I decided to do a little bit of extra research. I already knew pretty much everything there is to know about spectrograms because they're very, very easy to understand once you understand them. Uh, it doesn't take that long to actually. It only took me a few days. It should only take you a few days to fully understand what they show. Um, especially if you're using the seismic program Swarm. The seismic program Swarm really helps a great deal in learning a lot about seismology. Just the program itself helps. Um, so my, my video on spectrograms that I created is up. It's the video just prior to this one. But I will also leave a link in the description box below just in case if you can't find it or or whatever. But I'll be, leave a link in the description box below. So if you want to know about spectrograms and you want to separate the truth from the fiction, then please go check out that video. And I show a great deal of proof and resources and everything. So it's not like I'm just spouting something, you know. So I back it up. So go check that out if you want. Now. I'm going to start with the earthquakes here. Remember the 4.6 in Monroe that woke me up in the middle of the night? Remember, I believe it was about 2.51 a.m. when it woke us up. Everything was rattling. It was very, very, very fun. My daughter did not like it. Um, well, we've been having some aftershocks. Now, after the earthquake itself, notice how the aftershocks are pretty low. 1 1.7, 1 1.6, 0 0.9, 1.5, 1.3, 1.2, 1 you know, about mid-range ones, right? Then all of a sudden, boom, there's this 2.0 just on the 12th, actually, which I reportedly felt. I did feel it. Very, very tiny, tiny shaking. I'm surprised I felt this 2.0 and not the recent aftershocks. Then after that, there was a 2.3 the next day. And you can tell there are multiple small aftershocks in the middle of these events. But I'm just focusing on the twos. Notice how I went from 2.0 to 2.3. Then the next day, we had a 2.5. Then... A few days later, we had a 2.4 on the 16th, so about the same size of a 2.5, and then we had a 3.0. Now, really, there's no way to tell if these are four shocks, but I do have to say, although a 4.6 may shake up the area a bit, it's still technically kind of a small earthquake. It's a moderate quake. It really shouldn't be putting off this, this amount of aftershocks and the aftershock should not be growing in magnitude, at least in my opinion. From what I've seen from tectonic areas and other areas of the world, usually, and I'm no, no professional, guys, but I'm just saying just from my experience, from what I've witnessed, from what I've studied, it almost looks like larger earthquakes can cause aftershocks to remain strong for a long, long, long period of time. But at 4.6, we should be starting to see the aftershocks die down right now. We really should not be seeing any threes, really at all. But you notice how how there were really were no magnitude 2. I mean, of course, there's a 3.5 aftershock, but that was just two minutes after the 4.6. And remember, I live right here, so the threat of a large earthquake along the southern Woodby Island Fault Zone, along the Seattle Fault Zone, or the Cascadia Subduction Zone over to the west is all too real. Three faults we got to worry about, guys, and, and one of them's a subduction zone. Um, but the 2.0, the 2s, didn't start until the 12th, which was... The morning after, I believe. I believe that was the morning after the uh, 4.6. Then we saw 2.3, then 2.5, and then 2.4, and then 3.0. Why are magnitudes possibly getting larger? And notice how it is heading this way. I'm sorry, it, it, my computer's a little slow today, guys. It's heading towards the west-southwest. Notice that? It was starting to trend southwest, but it's starting to head west right now right towards the southern Whidbey Island Fault Zone, which runs all the way through here, all the way up to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and all the way to the southwest, possibly as far as Duval down here. And we would get the strongest shaking in Bothell, Maltby. Maltby's right on top of the southern Whidbey Island Fault. Snohomish would be devastated, Muckleteo, Linwood, Everett. And the southern Whidbey Island Fault has not ruptured in 3,000 years. 3,000 years, guys. Wow. That's 1,900 years more than the Seattle Fault, which ruptured 1,100 years ago. So it's definitely been a long time since we've seen a major quake there. And I'm since I live here, this threat is all too real. I'm hoping that these really are aftershocks. But it is strange, because in the past, what, uh, what I've seen from aftershocks from like a 4 or a 5, usually the magnitudes die down. And this, 
The 4.6 occurred on the 12th. And on the 17th, we're getting a 3.0. And we just got that. And I, di I did not feel it. I should have felt it if I was paying attention, but I think that was during my nap time. <laughs> no joke, I was actually taking a small nap during then. Remember when we used to hate naps when we were kids? Oh, they are wonderful nowadays. <laughs> so, just want to let you guys know, these are probably aftershocks, but there is a small chance that these are four shocks to a larger quake. I hope not, but let's move on. Here we are on my website under the Seismic Events menu, by event, go to Steamboat Geyser 2019. Steamboat Geyser erupted this morning, early this morning. 28th eruption occurred on 12, uh, at, excuse me, 1212 UTC, July 18th, 2019, which would be 612 AM Mountain Time, July 18th, 2019. Typical steamboat eruption right here. It's been about a week since the last eruption. Could be returning to its near weekly schedule. And you can see it on the heli quarter right here. Custom made from the size of program swarm. The most recent eruption is the 28th eruption of 2019, which is the 60th eruption. Yes, we've hit the 60th eruption since it reactivated in early 2018. Again, June 2019 broke a record of its own. Steamboat erupted seven times in June, setting an all-time record for eruptions in one calendar month. Steamboat still seems to be alive and well. We only need five more eruptions to beat the all-time yearly record of 32 eruptions, which was achieved by Steamboat Geyser in 2018. If Steamboat keeps erupting regularly, we should beat the 2018 record in the next month or so. Stay tuned. Yeah, guys, we only need five more eruptions to beat the record. That's it. Only five. Only five. Woohoo! So, Steamboat's still alive and well, guys. Erupted just this morning. Here we are in Southern California near Ridgecrest, California and the Coso Volcanic Field. We still are seeing a good-sized gap of seismicity supposedly where the magma chamber is located. This area right here has been extremely calm compared to the north-northwest and the southwest down here. And again, this is primarily where the magma chamber at Coastal Volcanic Field is located, right where this gap of seismicity is occurring. Now, over here, up in the Coastal Volcanic Field in the north-northwest section or so, we do see more earthquakes broke out. Now I want to go to largest magnitude first, if my computer will let me. 4.6 last night, guys. There's a 4.6 within the Coastal Volcanic Field right here. Remember, the volcanic field pretty much spans from all the way up here all the way in this area, this whole area right here. Multiple cinder cones, lava flows, lava domes, very active historically in this area. Uh, not saying an eruption's coming, but I definitely think it is within the realm of possibility, not soon, but I think that this earthquake sequence could have kick-started something if we don't see this seismicity calm down. If seismicity pretty much ends, then really there's, I'm going to say there's probably no chance of a volcanic eruption. But even if a volcanic eruption occurred at Coastal Volcanic Field, there, it really would not be too crazy, guys. I have to say, it's only about 5% rhyolitic melt down there. Maybe if it went up to 10%, it wouldn't be too, too crazy because the magma chamber is not that large. And historically, it has not had any very explosive eruptions. They've primarily been very slow-moving lava flows, some lava doming, you know. So, that's pretty much it. We had a 4.6 down there. We're going to take a look at the event page real quick. Multiple aftershocks within the mid to high range threes down there in Coastal Volcanic Field near Ridgecrest, California. 127 people reported feeling it. Let's go to origin just real quick. Let's go to phases. Come on, buddy. Arrival time. Let's see. Broadband vertical. Let's use this one right here. WMF in the CI network. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with the most recent data obtained from WMF in the CI network dash dash location code because none is given broadband vertical. Since it's a broadband channel, I'm going to add a one hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background micro -seisms. Station WMF resides closest to this earthquake last night and it resides within the coastal volcanic field. Here's the magnitude 4.6. Very, very strong. I'm going to turn down the strength just a little bit just a tad just a little bit <clears throat> okay so look at all of these aftershocks guys there's the 4.6 check out all of these aftershocks occurring in rapid succession multiple mid to high range threes right there almost a 4.0 it's part of the aftershock sequence of this 4.6 so we're still seeing some particularly intense seismic activity within the coastal volcanic field 
And most of the seismicity now is actually starting to be concentrated in the coastal volcanic field. Of course, quakes are still popping off along the Ridgecrest Fault, which is what I'm calling that fault, uh, that ruptured during the 7.1. Uh, but it does seem like seismicity is continuing. I thought it would be dying down by now, guys. It looked like it was starting to truly die down. But look at how many, all of these earthquakes, guys. Every spike, almost every single spike. Look at the clear PNS wave arrivals. Almost every single spike you see is an earthquake. So many, in fact, that the data is so saturated, they will not be able to report all of these, guys. No, they will not. Look, we still got a strong one right there. Some strong ones right there. Probably mid-range three right there. And let's go all the way down to the most recent data, guys. All the way down right here. Look at the strength of these, guys. So we're still seeing some good size threes. Look at all these. It is still popping off like crazy. I thought that was a low frequency event for a second. <laughs> I forgot I was kind of zoomed in. A lot of events, guys. And of the most recent data stream as of 11.24 a.m. Pacific Time, July 18, 2019, we are still seeing some quakes down here. But, what is that? Hold on a second. It wasn't there. Very interesting. So it starts right about here, no? It starts right about here. What is this? Okay, that's interesting. Hold on one second, I'll be back in just a second. I'm gonna check one of the neighboring stations just real quick. So here I have data from a station a few miles away, WCS2. We are not seeing that low frequency event here. But if this is truly low frequency background tremor, I don't know what it could be caused by, possibly from the volcanic activity underground, from the magma chamber maybe. I don't think so though, because it's extremely weak. Only going to about 60 amplitude count, barely even noticeable. 1753.32 and 1753.33, so that would be right about here. We really don't see it. And that is basically the same time range, so we should see the low frequency event there, but we do not see it on the neighboring station. So I don't know what this low frequency activity is. Let me zoom in. Look at that. It is very intriguing, though. Doesn't it look kind of interesting? Low frequency background tremor, but extremely, extremely weak. It could just be maybe a storm is passing by. I don't think so, though. But it's not showing on surrounding stations, so I don't know. Look at that right there. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, I'm going to just keep a close, close eye on this. And if any of, any of this gets stronger, if any of it changes, I will let you guys know very quickly. And notice there, guys, we do have a few earthquakes reported down in Hawaii near the Pahala area. And some of these are not earthquakes. Remember, sometimes they report spasmodic tremor as earthquakes occurring part of those sequences. Other times they record them as diamonds and report them as quote-unquote other event. But as you will see, spasmodic tremor is occurring. It occurred the past few days multiple times and seems to be possibly increasing. I'm going to put out an analysis page on that tonight or tomorrow morning. Keep an eye out for that. It probably will be up tonight because I already have half of it done because some of these spasmodic tremor events did strike after I was about to put up a post. So I'm just going to include the most recent spasmodic tremor in that post. So keep an eye out for that. Let's go to volcanoes.usgs.gov real quick. Now here we have TRAD, the web recorder from volcanoes.usgs.gov. Now you notice we do have a few quakes in the area. We definitely do. And notice we have spasmodic tremor right here. Two separate episodes right here in the past 24 hours. You're probably going to say, Ben, that looks like a surface event. Well, I've already been over this with you guys, but just for the new viewers, if you see it on a station many, 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 many miles away, look, we see spasmodic tremor. First episode, second episode, past 24 hours. Remember, if it's a surface event, it will not correlate on a separate station. Or even multiple stations. Here we have a different seismic station closer to the epicenter. Oh, looks like we possibly had another spasmodic tremor event up here, but I'll take a closer look at that later. Uh, looks like we had, there's the first event, second event, past 24 hours, multiple earthquakes afterwards. Let's go to a different station. Let's go to PLAD, which resides on Mauna Loa's Summit, right here. If it'll go. Come on, laggy boy. Yeah, there we go. Look at PLAD. And these stations are many, many miles from each other, so you know that these really are spasmodic tremor events. Earthquake activity still continues at Mauna Loa. 
uplift still continues at both the Mauna Loa Summit and the Kilauea Summit, and also along the Kilauea East Rift Zone as well. Past 48 hours, we see spasmodic tremor event right there. We do have one right there, and one right there, and one right there. So about four in the past two days or so. And I'll put out an analysis post tonight. And it looks like ever since the past two spasmodic tremor seismicity could be increasing for the Mauna Loa area. So just keep an eye out for Mauna Loa, guys. We're going to take a look at these spasmodic tremor events from this station, TRAD, which is my favorite station to look at spasmodic tremor from. Remember, if you want to know what spasmodic tremor is and why volcanic spasmodic tremor is so important to understanding the volcanic activity underneath the Big Island of Hawaii, please come to this post here. I will, of course, leave a link to it in the description box below. Just go to the description box, go to links, should be right in there has all my observations and a lot of information about where these are occurring. They're occurring within the mantle plume itself, showing most likely magma recharge of the volcanoes in the area, which currently are showing unrest, particularly Mauna Loa, which is currently at a yellow advisory state. So that's it for right there. Let's take a look at today's spasmodic tremor in the seismic program swarm. And so notice we see normal spasmodic tremor events, pretty weak, but they, it looks like they lasted a pretty long time. The longest I've ever seen for a spasmodic tremor event is an hour and 11 minutes. Let's see how long this one lasted right here, which is the first one of, oh, looks like there are two separate ones in rapid succession. I would say it is just one, but you can clearly tell these are two spasmodic tremor events within just a few minutes of each other. First one lasted from 419 UTC to about 438. So, what, about 20 minutes long? And the other one is probably just as long, about 20 minutes long. And the amplitudes of these events were not large. They were not crazy, but typical spasmodic tremor event. Many earthquakes and tremor occurring as part of spasmodic tremor. Again, if you want to know what it is, just go to that post on my website. And also go into Google and type in seismic spasmodic tremor. And they do have some other examples on there as well if you want to learn about spasmodic tremor. But the ones in the case of Hawaii are volcanic in nature occurring within the mantle plume. So we had two of them right there. A few earthquakes in the past 24 hours. Some good sized ones. This one I'm gonna say is pretty deep. This looks like a deep quake, possibly unless this station is very far away from the epicenter. But I don't know. I don't know guys. Scrolling down, we do see more quakes are occurring. Some tiny ones as of the past few hours, but that's pretty much it. Keep an eye out for my coming analysis post, which will show plots from four seismic stations across the entire Big Island of Hawaii for the recent spasmodic tremor events in the past three to four days. Hope you guys have a great day. Again, if you want to learn about spectrogram plots, what they are, and how to read them, and what they actually show, please go to my most recent video. Again, a link to it will be in the description box below. I gotta go. Gonna go outside and play with my daughter. Hope you have a great day. God bless, and I'll see you later.